we're starting to to understand there are lots of uh, uh, climate models that have been used, for example, by the IPCC. There are models now looking at flood and fire and how this impacts physical infrastructure. Um, and so what's important to note is that there are different ways the physical risks play through different channels and lead to financial impact. So for example, with asset destruction, um, there could be write-offs or write-downs of these assets. The, the useful life of these assets may be reduced. There may be also capital um, to replace, rebuild. Are you able to rebuild to a better um, level that is more resilient or are you only able to uh, replace uh, physical risks, disrupt business operations? Uh, this can be the physical risks to your property, but it can also be um, disruptions such as employees not being able to get to work, supply chain disruptions. Uh, we're becoming very fam familiar with hearing about this, even in relation to COVID. The way to think about it is that there are some direct impacts, but then there are some second order impacts as well. For example, um, with insurance coverage. So as there is increased payouts, insurers are looking at you know, how to adjust their own um, balance sheet. And as that happens, insurance premiums may be go up. Um, insurance availability may go down. And so these are other ways to think about how physical risks are playing out. If there is protracted, um, you know, occurrence of uh, climate events, it could mean that there are feedback loops. If there are tighter financial conditions, if there is lower household wealth over uh, a period of time, that can also create um, feedback loops. It can lead to what you may call political risk, um, as we see migration patterns uh, change. Uh, there is political risk, which I think in the US, for example, with um, migration, you know, people are leaving the South uh, because there's, there's crop failure and there is drought. Um, and so these are all the kinds of risks that, you know, when we think of flood and drought and sea level rise, we have to then determine what is the financial uh, impact of these. Turning to transition risks. Uh, similarly, these play out through different channels. And some of the ones to point out are policy change. So this is a big one. There is um, from the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, they produce something called the uh, inevitable policy response. So this is a consortium trying to look at how is policy around the world transitioning so that we can have a useful model um, to sort of not predict or forecast, but inform our decision making to see these are the potential scenarios that could play out and what decisions can we make in the interim that would win in any of these scenarios. We're not sure which one will materialize. Um, and one key poli policy change is the carbon price. Um, so Canada, I think, has handled this well in the sense we've committed to get the carbon price per ton to $170 in Canada. And we've set out that timeline so that businesses can plan, prepare, know that this is coming. Um, some organizations decide to use what's called a shadow price on carbon. So this is an internal price. We know it's going to 170. Let's apply a price of 170 per ton of carbon in our decision making today. And that can help with, um, you know, incorporating that price now to start to create efficiencies. It can also help to ring fence funds that you set aside to in invest into um, climate adaptation and climate action measures. This could also be as simple as investing in technology as we invest in renewables. One, they might B, you know, it's a different cost structure. Two, are we betting on the right technology? Are we, um, do we have uh, education and training needs to get people to know how to use the new technology? So these are all parts of transition risk. Another one is litigation risk. I'll get to that shortly, but we'll talk about that in a bit. 
one of the probably most ubiquitous um, transition risks that I think will be relevant to a lot of your organizations is how the behavior of investors and financial institutions is changing. So you will have heard of um, big commitments like that made at Glasgow called the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero or you know the Net Zero Investors Alliance. There's lots of alliances where um, investors, lenders, financial institutions are committing to go net zero in their own book. Um, they want to identify and um, reduce their exposure to climate risk in their portfolios. It did certainly start with investors, institutional investors, who have seen that there is also a better return from um, uh, companies that have ESG or envi environmental social governance at their heart. You probably have heard about this in another workshop as well. But um, <clears throat> companies that integrate ESG have seen to have better uh, long-term risk-adjusted returns. So investors have certainly paid attention and have started to ask for data and look at how they can integrate this into their own capital allocation. Um, but now this is applies to lenders as well. All the Canadian banks have committed to net zero by 2050. Van City Credit Union has committed to net zero in lending by 2040. And so you could expect that there will be more um, demand for information on what you are doing. When you go to get capital, you may get a better cost of capital if you can show um, some proactive action on this, if you have data on what you are doing around climate. And with respect to trade, a question that's often asked is, well, will we become less competitive if we are taking action on climate? And I think probably most of you in the, that room know that actually sustainability provides a competitive advantage, but it's also important to know that the EU has what's called a border carbon adjustment in place now. The US and Canada are considering this, and that would put a carbon tariff on imports um, from higher carbon um, jurisdiction, so that would help level the playing field as well. So putting this all together, we can see how um, the financial system is starting to think about climate risk and how they're seeing that this all plays out into the financial system. So really making the connection between climate and finance so that we can use the tools of finance to then take even stronger action on climate change. Thinking about how this may play out for your organizations, um, there's two sort of buckets when we see climate is impacting finance, it's impacting financial performance. So this is how are your revenues impacted? Um, uh, is there a change in consumer preferences? Um, are you losing revenue due to disruptions in your operations? But there's also what's happening to your expenditures. Is the carbon price um, going to increase the cost of inputs? We are looking at inflation right now, and uh, it's, it's not hard to see how um, this could play out in terms of long-term planning and, and cost structures. We mentioned earlier the impact climate is actually not only a business risk, which we have been focused on, it's the biggest health emergency that we face as well. Um, and so uh, bringing that lens in, there is sort of the logistical um, impact on employees, but there are also impacts on health, well-being, if people's incomes or livelihoods are impacting, impacted, this is a huge mental health toll as well. And then there's brand. I mean, you know, there are reputational risks. So we talked about uh, litigation. There is an emerging field of climate litigation, which is perhaps not super emerging anymore. Um, it's in sort of its third or fourth wave. It's like climate litigation 4.0 now. Um, and most of the cases are brought against national governments. Um, for example, for failure to take strong enough action on climate. Um, but there are some cases brought against corporates, and two of them you may be familiar with. One of them was a um, beneficiaries of a pension fund in 
Australia. So this is against pension funds. Um, but one of the beneficiaries was um, sort of young, 19, 20. And he said that his pension fund was failing to take climate into account, which would impact him as a beneficiary in the future. And so it was against a retail superannuation fund in Australia and they settled and um, they agreed to create a net zero target and net zero transition plan. And then another really high profile one you will have heard of, which is um, against Shell. So it was a group of NGOs that um, in Holland brought a case against Shell um, saying that their decarbonization targets did not go far enough. They had decarbonization targets, but they were, um, you know, the baseline was sort of questionable and they were based on um, intensity targets, which the NGOs sort of said this isn't going to be uh, getting there fast enough. And actually the Dutch courts um, ordered Shell to reduce their emissions in a much more urgent um, timeline, which is much more science based. So there is a little bit more of this and there is a trend towards a bit of litigation between corporates where corporates sue each other, mainly on the basis of um, consumer protection. And so this is, you know, greenwashing allegations. Well, you say that you're net zero, you prove it, you, you've got it in your advertising, but there's nothing that we, that we can see that means that you're really net zero. So you can see, expect to see a little increase in that. So reputation and brand can be very important. The other way that climate risk impacts um, finance is through financial position. And so this is thinking about the value um, of your assets, um, what is the risk of damage, and then as we discussed, access to capital and financing, and what is it doing to your cost of capital. I will uh, turn over to Irina. Thank you for your attention, and we look forward to uh, working with you further and discussing your questions.